the nightmare of a new order. A Führer, his people, and race. Crimes against humanity. A world of chaos and destruction. This is the story of humanity's darkest hour. The Abyss. September the 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. Hitler's Luftwaffe bombs cities, killing thousands of civilians. Within two weeks, Warsaw is surrounded. American photographer and cameraman Julian Bryan has been visiting Warsaw. He documents death and suffering in the besieged city. In a broadcast on Polish radio, he appeals directly to the US president. President Roosevelt and the people of America, my name is Brian, Julian Bryan, American photographer. I speak from the besieged city of Warsaw, Poland. Yesterday, I saw four women picking potatoes in the open fields outside of Warsaw. Fifty yards away lay the bodies of two other peasant women, dead only a few hours from the machine gun bullets of a German plane. A little girl of ten rushed up, sobbing hysterically, and fell on her knees before the body of her dead sister. She shrieked, Oh, my sister! Nearby, a little boy of five played all alone. His mother lay dead upon the ground near him. He could not understand. I must speak to tell everyone in America, including you, President Roosevelt, America must act. It must help. Hitler is working on the assumption that the US will not lift a finger to help Poland. Neither will Britain or France. No one will hinder his campaign to extend his sway to the east and subjugate other peoples there. Just a few days after his appointment as Reich Chancellor, Hitler made a speech to the general staff where he made it abundantly clear that his foreign policy would lead to a war for Lebensraum, living space. The Second World War is the war Hitler always wanted because he thought that it was only in that kind of conflict that the Germany that could survive for all times could be created. Britain and France declare war on Germany but take no action. The last chance to put a check on Hitler has been missed. It would have been the right thing to do to march into Germany, to make war on Germany. October 1935, four years before the invasion of Poland. At a military display at the Reich Harvest Festival, a million spectators watch a dummy village set on fire by bombers. After its defeat in the Great War and the Versailles Treaty that followed, Germany is not allowed to have an air force. Hitler greets his guests on the podium. This military display was also of interest to foreign military attaches. They were sitting there, observing the rearmament of the Third Reich at close quarters and all its newest weapons. Six months later, German troops march into Cologne. Once again, Hitler is breaking the treaty with the victorious powers, since the Rhineland, on France's border, is supposed to remain demilitarized. Germans like the fact that the Führer isn't scared to take action. The occupation of the Rhineland, where the French had imposed an unpleasant police administration, 
gained him colossal approval. It extended way beyond people who'd voted for the NSDAP. In 1936, say, it would have been easy to send a French division against the few soldiers who marched into the Rhineland, and the whole thing would have been nipped in the bud. And that is the criticism that is now made of France and Britain. But then that's from today's perspective. By letting Hitler get away with it, the Western powers helped to enhance the dictator's prestige. So when Hitler started to say, all I want to do is to rectify these injustices, they thought, OK, well, we'll believe him, we'll let him do it. The Versailles Treaty allows Germany 100,000 soldiers. By 1939, that figure will have multiplied by 10 to more than a million under arms. At the 1936 Nuremberg rally, Hitler reveals his aim. The German Wehrmacht must be ready for war within three years. The head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring, is to make that possible. Germany starts an ambitious rearmament program. The Western powers, by contrast, are tired of war. Their defense expenditure remains modest. Between 1935 and 1938, the USA spends roughly $4 billion on arms. Great Britain, a little more. France, slightly less. The German Reich invests massively, far more than the three other countries put together. Why shouldn't Germany have its own armed forces if they, they had the same? This was generally accepted by most politicians, statesmen in Britain and France. They couldn't really grasp that Hitler wasn't playing by the rules. The Allies, especially the British, had an increasingly bad conscience about Versailles. But because of that bad conscience, the British didn't realize where the whole thing was going. Hitler wasn't pursuing a revision of Versailles, he wanted a war with quite different goals. The German economy is running at full tilt. The Autobahn network is being extended. The tax on private cars is abolished to stimulate sales. The idea is that these vehicles can be commandeered in wartime to transport reinforcements. Unemployment dropped. That was achieved above all through the rearmament program and the planned economy, by the awarding of contracts by the state using unbacked checks and forced loans that were kept secret. The unbacked checks are the idea of Reichsbank president Hjalmar Schacht. They're known as MEFO currency. The collaboration between Schacht and Hitler was absolutely essential to the working of the regime in its first years. Schacht is really the man who creates the financial framework that allows the expansion of the armaments program and the realization of the key objective of Hitler's regime. Since the unbacked MEFO currency doesn't appear in the official balance sheets of the Reichsbank, Hitler can keep the true level of arms expenditure secret. The MEFO, in a sense, is in the position to print money. It's an indirect mechanism for financing armaments expansion, which takes on huge dimensions, in which the Reichsbank collaborates with the military authorities and the Nazi regime to use this off-balance sheet vehicle, the MEFO, as an intermediary to finance huge expansion within uh, the armaments industries. In 1934, MEFO currency is printed to a value of more than two billion Reichsmarks. Three years later, Debts have accumulated to a level of 12 billion Reichsmarks. In 1938, the MEFO currency is due to be redeemed by the government. But Hitler wants to delay the redemption indefinitely. Schacht refuses to continue the policy of debt financing and resigns. The workers in the armaments industries couldn't care less where the money comes from. They're just glad to have a secure income. The NSDAP won a lot of approval, 
particularly from the younger generation. The mass unemployment at the beginning of the 1930s had been a formative experience for them. And of course, with their massive rearmament program, the Nazis had eradicated unemployment by the mid-1930s. At the Wehrmacht's autumn maneuvers in 1937, Hitler reviews his troops. The generals are enthusiastic about the Führer's rearmament policies. And of course, they know that at the end of it, they will go to war. Young, talented men no longer see their future as lawyers, which is obviously one of the high roads to success in German society, and instead devote themselves to a military career as, as an officer. Mid-July 1936, in Spain, fascists launch a military coup against the elected leftist government. Bloody battles follow. The leader of the revolt, General Franco, asks Hitler to send aircraft to transport troops from Spanish Morocco. Hitler agrees. Goering sends part of his new Luftwaffe to Spain, giving it the name Condor Legion. It's a great opportunity to test the new air force in a real war. By the end of 1936, more than 100 German bombers and fighters are serving with the Spanish fascists. As early as December 1936, there were raids on several Andalusian villages, whose only purpose was to test the weapons. Hundreds were killed, and the results were measured and documented to improve Germans' military capabilities. The men of the Condor Legion want to show what they can do. Not all of them are committed Nazis, but they are all enthusiastic flyers. For them, Spain is a great adventure. In the spring of 1937, the Condor Legion begins a murderous bombing campaign against Spanish civilians. One of the targets is the small Basque town of Guernica. The New York Times writes of more than 1,600 dead and 900 injured. At Guernica, the Luftwaffe bomb and strafe defenseless civilians. These raids are the Nazis' first war crimes. The whole German involvement was a war crime. This was an undeclared war, a revolt against a democratically elected government, with a unit taking part from a foreign country, virtually as mercenaries. By the time the Condor Legion returns to Germany to be showered with honors, it's clear that Hitler's new Luftwaffe has helped pave the way for Franco's victory. The Luftwaffe is ready for a bigger war. The Berghof at Obersalzberg. Open day for local children. The Führer appears as a civilian, friendly and approachable. The Berghof now becomes the second center of government, after Berlin. Only the very top of the Nazi hierarchy, or people who have the Führer's ear for other reasons, are allowed to come here. Albert Speer, his architect, is one of them. And of course, Eva Braun, his secret lover. At official events, she has to stay in the background. It's a closed community, with courtiers and hangers-on, loyally devoted to their Führer. Hitler was quite a, a, a lazy but clever leader, if you like. He clearly had a lot of charismatic power over those who were prepared to listen to him. Durch seine 
his difficult background, the marginal existence he had led for decades, meant that he developed a remarkable social intelligence. He very often let the people below him fight it out among themselves, see who would emerge as the strongest, and then the last person to have his ear, who seemed to have come out of that lower battle, would then become the person whose policies he put into practice. One of Hitler's closest collaborators is Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, the man who controls the Nazis' terror apparatus. Heinrich Himmler was one of those people who became ever more indispensable to Hitler for the cold-blooded organization of power. Himmler also used his organizational skills to combat his adversaries within the party. As head of the SS, the police and the Gestapo, Himmler is extremely powerful. With Hitler's approval, he has established a system of surveillance that is both arbitrary and violent. Within days of the seizure of power, Himmler has set up concentration camps to incarcerate political opponents of the regime. In 1936, a purpose-built concentration camp is opened at Sachsenhausen near Berlin. Over the next few years, ever-increasing numbers of Jews, homosexuals, Sinti, Roma, and so-called antisocials will be interned here. Sachsenhausen, at the, very, at the very beginning, was also set up as a kind of a political education center, and then it became very quickly a concentration camp, one of the most brutal. The purpose of Sachsenhausen was to control the German population and make them, uh, you know, to contain elements that might in some way undermine or criticize the Nazi system and Hitler himself. In public, Hitler likes to come across as kind to children, approachable, and even funny. Hitler could be very charming. It's amazing. He could reel people in. And he knew it. One of the people Hitler reels in is former British Prime Minister David Lloyd George. He visits Hitler in 1936 while on holiday in Berchtesgaden. He's there on behalf of the government in London. Hitler pulls out all the stops. Lloyd George is impressed. On his return, he writes a newspaper article calling his host the greatest living German. He says the Germans have definitely made up their minds never to quarrel with us again. Other foreign politicians make their pilgrimage to Hitler. Hitler sends one a signed photo like a pop star to a fan. They want to see the positive in him. They want to see him as the solution, because the alternative would be war. In September 1937, Benito Mussolini makes a state visit to Germany and receives a hero's welcome. Hitler and Mussolini are kindred spirits, sharing the same fascist ideology and the goal of aggressive territorial expansion. Hitler looked up to Mussolini as the first fascist dictator. So it was a very much a kind of master-pupil relationship. But as time went on, the relationship changed. Both dictators are allied with Japan's Emperor Hirohito, whose army is currently fighting a brutal war of conquest in China. Japan's soldiers are committing war crimes against the civilian population. In Asia, the Second World War, with its unimaginable atrocities, has already begun. Meanwhile, Germany continues rearming. Hitler wants to start his own conquests without delay. First in his sights is his homeland, Austria. Early spring 1938, Hitler with his new foreign minister, von Ribbentrop. Ribbentrop has been chosen because his predecessor opposes Hitler's plans towards Austria. 
Hitler had it was at this meeting that Hitler revealed his plans for expansion. He made it clear he was planning a war against Austria and Czechoslovakia, that he wanted to absorb these territories into the German Reich. Many think these scenarios are unrealistic. There are people who warn him that he is underestimating the readiness of the British and the French to go to war. Hitler believes his critics are simply scared. He wants to get moving. On March the 12th, 1938, Hitler's troops occupy Austria. There is no resistance and they're greeted as heroes. Even if the Anschluss of Austria takes place peacefully, it's a further breach of international treaties. The Anschluss of Austria was hanging in the air. The majority of the German and the Austrian population was in favor. There's no doubt about that. Hitler is greeted in Vienna like a victorious emperor. As he steps out onto the balcony of the royal palace to announce the Anschluss of Austria with Germany, a quarter of a million Austrians are there to cheer him on. The humiliation and persecution of Austria's Jews starts at once. Many are forced to scrub the sidewalk and clean off anti-Nazi slogans. The order comes directly from Himmler, head of the SS. Verbal anti-Semitism is already unbelievably harsh, and yet it still needs the Germans' drive and the German Anschluss in March 1938 to unleash unimaginable violence and unbelievable brutality against Vienna's Jewish population. Himmler's men arrest thousands of Jews they disappear into concentration camps like Dachau. The Anschluss of Austria is a great success for the Nazis. There isn't so much as a protest from Britain and France. To Hitler, it must seem like an invitation to take more territory. At the beginning of May 1938, Hitler visits Mussolini in Rome. His mistress, Eva Braun, travels with him, incognito. Mussolini gives Hitler his blessing for the Anschluss of Austria and carte blanche for the annexation of Czechoslovakia. While the dictators negotiate, Eva Braun and her girlfriends enjoy Italian beach life. They've escaped the boredom of Hitler's Berghof. A little Dolce Vita and Vino Rosso go a long way to raise the spirits. Meanwhile, the situation for Jews in Austria is becoming more and more precarious. Many are queuing up for papers to leave their homeland as soon as they can. They leave their empty apartments behind. Jewish photographer Robert Haas keeps a record before he has to leave himself. In Florence, sightseeing and shopping are the order of the day for Eva Brown's group. Shoes from Ferragamo are a special attraction. Back at home, the criminally expensive shoes feature on camera. The Berghof ladies indulge themselves while their husbands spread terror and violence. September the 15th, 1938. Hitler waits for an important guest at the Berghof. 
British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain has asked for a meeting. When Neville Chamberlain announces that he is going to meet the Fuhrer, it is the most amazing diplomatic coup that anybody can remember. His reason for wanting to meet Hitler face to face is the question, is this man mad? If he is like clinically mad, then that we need to know that. If he is in some way capable of acting rationally, then maybe we can have a bargain. Chamberlain is fascinated by Hitler and Hitler wraps him round his little finger. Back in Britain, Chamberlain is sure he can negotiate a non-aggression pact with Hitler and avert the danger of war in Europe. But Hitler seeks escalation by provoking increased tensions with Czechoslovakia. Following the Anschluss of Austria, the democratically elected Czech president, Edvard Benisch, fears a German invasion. He proposes to buy Hitler off by handing over a small part of the Sudetenland. But Britain and France are against the plan. The majority of the Sudetenland's population are German. Since the end of the Great War, it's been part of Czechoslovakia. But Hitler doesn't just want the Sudetenland, he wants the whole country in the Reich. And Poland and Hungary also claim border regions in eastern Czechoslovakia. Hitler has no intention of negotiating. He wants to make war and march victorious into Prague. At a second meeting, Chamberlain offers a deal. Hitler gets the whole of Sudetenland and London its peace agreement. If you want to understand appeasement, to realize that they live under the shadow of the bomber. There is a fear of air power, which is grossly exaggerated in terms of its impact, but is very potent. And that Germany is building up air power, which can have almost devastating effects on a city like London or Paris. It's that atmosphere of fear that helps to explain why they treat a country like Czechoslovakia as a minor pawn on the chessboard of Europe. On September the 29th, 1938, the leaders meet again in Munich. Hitler hopes the British will abandon the proposed treaty so that he can go to war. Goering urges caution. It's too soon for a war against Czechoslovakia. The Italian leader Mussolini is also against war. Late that evening, Hitler reluctantly signs the Munich Agreement. Hitler was very annoyed. They'd stolen his war. Hitler was furious at having to agree to the Munich settlement, but he's being told all the time by his generals that Germany wasn't ready for a general European war. And there were some generals who actually drew up a plan to arrest him and put him in prison to stop this conflict coming. As Chamberlain proudly presents the agreement on his return to London, Hitler is already planning to break it and gives orders to prepare for the invasion of Czechoslovakia. Hitler is absolutely determined that the next time, and there will be a next time, he's going to have the war that he wants. In mid-March 1939, Hitler summons Czech president Emil Hacha. Hacha is the successor to Edvard Benesch, who has resigned following the Munich Agreement. Hacha is put under such pressure that he agrees to the occupation of his country. Once again, war is avoided. Another democracy has been erased from the map of Europe. The German Reich has absorbed Austria, most of the Czech Republic, and the Memel territory next to Lithuania. There is a fascist alliance with Italy. 
Hungary and Poland have authoritarian regimes. Suddenly democracy no longer seemed to be a form of government that could cope with the problems of those times. That led to a politics of looking the other way, of caving in, in the hope that if we give in, he'll stop, then he'll be quiet. While Hitler's admirers celebrate his successes, cracks are beginning to show. Fear of a new war is losing Hitler's support with ordinary Germans. Hitler was popular as long as he could appear as the Prince of Peace, coming up with a solution at the 11th hour under extreme circumstances. Now his popularity waned. The first serious doubts arise during the Sudeten crisis, the fear that there may be a war. And that does make people wonder whether this is the right regime. And at the same time, domestic terror is growing, domestic surveillance, people are being sent to concentration camps or even shot for the slightest reason. And not everyone approves of the brutal persecution of the Jews. After the November pogrom, more than 6,000 Jewish men are imprisoned in Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Most are released on condition that they leave Germany at once. The world is upside down. A trunk is collected by a courier company. It's June 1939. Eva Braun is going on a cruise the government airliner Grenzmark is flying her and her family to Hamburg. Eva's father, brother and sister and two friends are going as well. The next day they board the Milwaukee in Hamburg, joining a cruise with Nazi officials. Their destination is the Norwegian fjords, as far up as the Lofoten Islands. Hitler has invited the Brown family and friends to join the trip. There's no lack of luxury on the ship. Eva takes a dip in the heated pool before a luncheon of lobster. But at home, the presses are working full tilt printing ration cards. In the coming war, basic foodstuffs like fats, milk and bread will be controlled. The Brown family won't have to worry about that. There's no rationing in Hitler's intimate circle. At the same time, Britain is mobilizing. Hitler has broken the Munich Agreement. It's a personal defeat for Chamberlain. Chamberlain was forced to issue a guarantee of Polish integrity and independence because Poland was clearly next on Hitler's list. The Grenzmark, the plane which took Eva Braun on holiday, now takes Foreign Minister Ribbentrop to Moscow. At the Kremlin, he is received by his Soviet counterpart, Vyacheslav Molotov. They sign a non-aggression pact. In a secret clause, Hitler and Stalin divide Poland between them, like prey they have yet to capture. In Poland, the news of the non-aggression pact caused panic and complete despair. But it also resulted in an immense wave of patriotism. We shall fight, they said, even if we have to fight alone. Who knows what the Germans will try to do? Hitler gambles on the diplomatic shock effect of this pact, and many Germans believe that the Western powers will protest again, but they don't have the guts. For Joachim von Ribbentrop, the pact is a great personal success. For Hitler, it is a coup. The war he has always aimed for is now within his grasp.
On September the 1st, 1939, at 4.47 a.m., the Schleswig-Holstein opens fire on Polish positions in the Bay of Danzig. German planes destroy the Polish Air Force, on the ground and in the air. Dive bombers attack the civilian population, just as in Spain three years before. There was a close connection because the people who carried out those first raids in Poland in September 39 were the same ones who'd fought in Spain. That was exactly what they had practiced in Spain, transferred one to one to Poland. On the very first day, bombing raids killed 1,200 people in the town of Wieluń. According to Nazi propaganda, the war has been forced on Germany. Reservists are called up throughout Hitler's Reich and given rapid training. Fear spreads in families for fathers, brothers and sons. The war wasn't popular in Germany. You see that from the way skepticism towards Hitler's government starts on the first day of the war with the successful invasion of Poland. But there is no direct opposition outside Poland. On September the 3rd, Britain and France declare war on Germany and do nothing else. The Wehrmacht attacks Poland from the north and from the west. Within days, German forces are advancing on Warsaw. After two weeks, the Polish capital is surrounded. In German towns, maps are displayed showing the army's advance to reassure the people. There's no mention of the measures being taken against Polish civilians. Poland's population has been divided into three. One part is to be murdered, a second can work, and the third, smaller part, can become German. Himmler's SS, following behind the Wehrmacht, commit barbarous atrocities against Poland's intellectual elite. Several thousand people are shot in the forests around the village of Piaznica. It's the first systematic mass murder committed by the SS. The terror aimed at the Polish population and important groups that were seen as political or cultural leaders was planned in advance. The Germans forced Poland's Jews to wear armbands with the Star of David. Anti-Semitism becomes official occupation policy. At first, there was no systematic terror against the Jews because that wasn't part of the political plan of this first phase. That started later. Of course, there were thousands of cases of harassment of Jews and murders. There are lots of photos showing Wehrmacht soldiers bullying ultra-Orthodox Jews in the street. Within months, the Germans will set up the first ghetto in Warsaw, using its inhabitants for slave labor. Meanwhile, in Britain, frustration is rising. The Prime Minister is reluctant to attack Germany. Chamberlain was still trying to get a peace. He was trying to involve Mussolini in negotiations. He still didn't understand that this is what Hitler was really about. It was conquest. It was a conquest of Europe. In the White House in Washington, President Roosevelt makes a statement on the German invasion. This nation will remain a neutral nation. But I cannot ask that every American remain neutral in thought as well. 
I hope the United States will keep out of this war. The only explanations for this stance are weakness, fear, cowardice or cynicism. There is no sensible reason or historical justification for this inactivity. Three weeks after the start of the invasion, Warsaw is under siege. American reporter Julian Bryan manages to smuggle film and photographs out of the country. I've just returned from Warsaw. For two weeks while in the besieged city, I photographed the struggles and agony of a people faced with the horror of modern war. When the bombs started falling, most of these mothers were removed from the wards and taken to the cellars, holding their newborn infants on their laps. Four days old, and already a casualty of war. May God have mercy on them. Brian takes his footage to the White House. And for the first time, President Roosevelt seems prepared to consider abandoning U.S. neutrality. There's a major meeting at the White House on the no November 14th, 1939, where he calls in the chief military people and he says, look, I am not actually very proud of what I wrote to Hitler urging a peace settlement during the Czech crisis and so on. And what we need in the United States is more muscle to ensure that we're taken seriously on the diplomatic stage. Hitler believes that none of them, neither the USA, nor Britain, nor France, can stop him. On September the 28th, 1939, General Johannes Blaskowitz accepts the Polish surrender. Several times, Blaskowitz has protested to his superiors at the brutal treatment of the civilian population by his own troops and by the SS. Does the German military have a conscience? There were certainly some generals in the invasion of Poland who objected very strongly to the extermination of Poles carried on, particularly by the SS, and protested. There's one general called uh, Blaskowitz. We can certainly recognize a moral conscience in the case of Blaskowitz. It begins with the bombing of Warsaw, when he asks, can we really drop incendiary bombs? Are we allowed to? But Hitler gets his way. Blaskowitz is certainly also morally horrified by the Einsatzgruppen, but that doesn't make him some kind of angel. Blaskowitz's army committed serious war crimes in Poland. Opposition from the generals is nothing new for Hitler. He doesn't take it seriously. He sees himself as a commander of genius. Hitler wasn't really a great general, uh, a great military man. He was bold and he was innovative in some ways, but he was also all or nothing, as he always said. I'm a gambler, I go for broke. November the 8th, 1939. Hitler departs for the Bürgerbräukeller in Munich. Every year he speaks to party veterans on the anniversary of the Putsch attempt in 1923. England will not in Frieden. At 9.20 p.m., a time bomb explodes, killing eight people. Hitler survives. He'd left the event shortly before the blast. The would-be assassin is soon caught. Nazi propaganda accuses carpenter Georg Elser of being a British secret agent. Today, we know that Georg Elser was working alone. 
so ein entscheidendes Motiv, warum er sich zum Anschlag His main motive for his assault on Hitler and the Nazi leadership was that he had realized back in fall 1938 that Hitler meant war. Other Germans didn't want to acknowledge that Hitler was preparing for war. Elsa machte sich Gedanken darüber, was Elsa saw it, he thought about what he could do, and then he carried it out with remarkable technical precision. He knew exactly what he was doing. Under interrogation, Elsa explains that he hid the bomb inside one of the pillars of the Bürgerbräu Keller on his own. The Gestapo don't believe him and torture him. He sticks to his story. The propaganda war continues. The order came directly from Chamberlain. Elsa is thrown into Dachau concentration camp without trial. After the final victory, there's to be a show trial. A few days before the end of the war, Hitler has him shot in the back of the neck. Georg Elsa wanted to prevent war and war crimes. He was a courageous hero, alone against Hitler. Spring 1940. Once again, Eva Brown flies back from a shopping holiday. Hitler is clearly delighted to see her at the Berghof. Eyewitnesses will later say this was the happiest time in their long relationship. At this moment, final touches are being put to the plan of campaign against France. Hitler has chosen a daring strategy. Most of his generals are against it. The greater part of the German tank force gathers in eastern Belgium. They must pass through the thick forests and hills of the Ardennes region, with few roads. To German military minds, it was impossible for tank divisions to advance through the Ardennes. The Ardennes are impassable. The tank drivers had to drive uh, three days and nights to get through them. And in fact, they were piled up with amphetamines in order to keep them awake for all the time. The risky plan succeeds. The Western powers expect the Germans to attack from the north, as they did in the First World War. But by coming through the Ardennes, the German tanks can attack from the south, and the Wehrmacht can force the enemy towards the channel. The decisive battle is fought around the French Channel port of Dunkirk. Hitler's Luftwaffe attacks not just Allied troops, but also fleeing civilians, just as in Spain and Poland. Hitler accepts his general's congratulations for the resounding victory over France. More than 80,000 French and Belgian soldiers are taken prisoner. The British expeditionary force did its best to escape from France, from Dunkirk, as fast as it could. And it looked as though Britain would soon follow France's lead and ask for peace negotiations. More than 300,000 Allied soldiers are evacuated across the Channel. Historians still debate Hitler's motives in letting the British army escape. Was it a sign that he wanted a deal with London? On his terms. Humiliated and defeated, Allied forces reach Britain. The French are forced to sign their capitulation in the same railway carriage where the Germans surrendered 22 years before. For Hitler, it's a source of great personal satisfaction. 
da wir wissen, wie die Geschichte Since we know how the story ends, we can say that in the summer of 1940, Hitler is at the peak of his power and at the peak of his popularity. When Hitler hears the ceasefire has been signed, his joy knows no bounds. He now rules half of Europe. It was one of the biggest shocks for people in their lifetimes. The Western Front falls apart in four weeks. Britain is alone, or at least alone with its empire to support it. And Roosevelt is sitting there thinking, what's going to happen next? At last, America is rearming. Roosevelt wants to have the ability to intervene in the war against Hitler. The American mobilization for World War II begins already in May 1940. As the Germans break through in France, Roosevelt commits the United States to becoming a peacetime military force on a huge scale with a navy, an army, and an absolutely gigantic air force. In London, Winston Churchill replaces the luckless Neville Chamberlain as prime minister. Churchill is clear that he must continue the war against Germany if the British Empire is to survive. And he speaks a language Hitler understands. In the House of Commons, he promises the British, we shall never surrender. What really infuriates Hitler is that after the fall of France, Churchill does not see sense and say, OK, we'll have a deal, some kind of arrangement where, you know, you can look after the continent or whatever and we'll be safe in our island home or something. So Churchill doesn't fit into uh, Hitler's scenario. As ruler of Europe, Hitler takes the next target in his sights. He wants to gain Lebensraum, living space for the Germans, in the east. And he wants to solve the Jewish question. This is the route to crimes against humanity.